All right, everyone. Well, we are uh, back and ready for our second presentation, the last of our virtual conference this year. Uh, and our second speaker this afternoon is Dr. Carl Eckbert. Uh, I think probably everyone here knows of Carl or has read Carl's works. Uh, and it is certainly a pleasure to have him uh, uh, being part of our conference this year. Uh, Carl, apart from also being a board member of the Center for French Colonial Studies, is Professor Emeritus of History from Illinois State University. Uh, he has many, many publications on the Illinois country and the French colonial experience in North America. Among his many publications are his seminal book on colonial St. Genevieve, Stealing Indian Women, and more recently, St. Louis Rising, the French Regime of Louis Saint-Ange de Belrive, co-authored with Sharon Person. And so we'll get right to it. As you can see on the screen, his topic is Franchon and the Foxes. Carl. Uh, thanks, Will. Uh, <laughs> let me say that when I, when I went to his hometown, uh, to talk about him with his, with one of his family members, uh, it was curious. They they pronounced the name Franchum, Franchum, and I I didn't know what they were what they were talking about for a bit. Huh? So I I like your pronunciation better, but uh, they were talking about Franchum. So uh, he came from. Uh, there's no way. Oh no, I can. Okay, so. He came, uh, we're way up on the northern frontier uh, near Charleville, uh, just to the west of Charleville, uh, 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 Franchum's <laughs> hometown. Uh, so it's up here, here's Charleville, and uh, his hometown of Montmayon was right over here on this, on the edge of the, the Parc Nation uh, Régional des Ardennes. Uh, he was born in uh, in 1703. So here is the, the Cassini map of mid 18th century, uh, sh showing that same forest and showing the uh, the, uh, the the village and parish of of Montmayon uh, right here. So we're we're up pretty close uh, uh, to Belgium here. Uh, so I got up there. Actually, I started by going to the pay tete to the post office and talking to them and finally finally discovering his uh, family up in uh, Montmayon. And I, I brought them a, a fancy uh, pastry from Paris and they gave me a dozen fresh eggs. And this is the, uh, the, the countryside around Montmayon uh, uh, with forest and, and rolling pasture just actually north of the, of the vineyards of of Northern Champagne. It's a, it's a very pretty area, but there are in fact lots of pretty areas uh, in France. And so uh, here is uh, the parish church uh, at Montmayon. Uh, and uh, Franchum was uh, baptized there in uh, 1703. Uh, here is his baptismal record. Uh, he was actually named after his, after down here, uh, his godmother, Nicole Pelletier. His real name is Pelletier. It's only a, one of these uh, fabricated names, huh? the D. Uh, his, his surname was really Pelletier. And uh, here's the signature of his godmother down here uh, after whom uh, he was named. Uh, here, here is actually the baptismal font. In which I should I should credit my wife Gloria with having taken these photographs. I was I was trying to do some other things in in Montmayon, but this is actually the baptismal font in which uh, our Nicolas uh, was baptized in 1703. Uh, so uh, we don't know much about his childhood except that he got a really hell of a good education uh, and and wrote in, in wonderfully clear French. And uh, as we shall see, was also able to, uh, to marshal legal arguments when he was hardly more than a kid. It's, it's really uh, kind of amazing. Hard to say how he was educated, I guess probably by a local priest, you know, I, 
uh, it's you know it's, this is Momayan's a pretty remote place actually so must have been the parish priest uh, and so he sailed out of uh, uh, La Rochelle uh, he knew a bit about America because his first cousin uh, Jean Jadar de Beaujon, uh, Beauchon was a uh, was an officer in the French Marines uh, in Mobile, so he 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 knew something about it. You know, it wasn't just just a blind trip, and uh, he was determined to go to America. Uh, and so here is the the La Rochelle uh, Harbor at about that time. Uh, of course, a very famous port for its uh, communications uh, with uh, Louisiana. Uh, so uh, they did, uh, they, they sailed over and uh, and stopped over in uh, Port-au-Prince in Saint-Domingue uh, before uh, sailing on to Mobile. So you can see down here is, is uh, Saint-Domingue and uh, up here would be Mobile, Gulf of Mexico, etc. Uh, everyone knows these maps, I guess. Uh, so here is the, the Bay of Mobile uh, and uh, Here's Pascagoula, and here's uh, Dauphin Island, uh, Ile uh, Dauphin, uh, and the harbor was here on the eastern end. This is a this is a relatively well known map by by uh, Jacques Nicolas Bellin. Uh, let's see, yeah. So here here's a Google map. It's not so different now. Uh, here the harbor was was over here. It's a, it's a kind of neat place. I've been out there a couple of times. It's a, they have some nice beaches there, as a matter of fact. So it's right here, obviously, at the entrance to, uh, uh, to Mobile Bay. And here is the harbor on that eastern end. There was a community, actually, uh, on that eastern end of, of Dauphin Island, or Ile Dauphine. That's actually feminine, isn't it? Uh, so when I was in Montmayon uh, talking to a descendant of his cousins, a descendant that is of uh, Jean Jardin, uh, uh, Guy Beauchon, uh, uh, he gave me a copy of this letter. And if you look at the top, you can see that it's from the Ile uh, Dauphine, uh, 15 March, March 1720. Uh, and he says in this letter, uh, it's kind of a neat letter. How many letters do you get like this, huh? Uh, so he he explains here that Pelletier uh, from Montmayon, uh, nomed, named Franchon, spelled a little differently, has arrived here uh, in this ship, the Duc de, the, the Duc de, de Noailles, uh, and uh, his recommendation is to him to get right back on that ship and go back to France because Louisiana is a goddamn miserable place. <laughs> that was his cousin's advice to him when he arrived uh, on the eastern end of, of Dauphin Island. Uh, it's a, his cousin had, had a bit of a wit, uh, and he said, we, we can't see this, all of this. I can't see it all, but his cousin said, uh, on the ship uh, came a, a 96 uh, girls and women uh, in order to, to populate the colony. But he says, one ha it has been forgotten to send us the 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 victuals, the the foodstuffs, so that we have energy enough to serve these women. Ha ha! No, right? Funny? Yeah, no, a little bit of Gallic wit. He's saying if you don't send us some food, we're not going to be able to do very well by these women. Uh, okay, so uh, from uh, Dauphin Island, uh, he must, I don't, though I don't know that, he must have gone to New Orleans, which is only a couple of years old, and then heads up river uh, to Fort Deschart, uh, which you can see at the top of the map. Uh, and uh, from there, he, uh, by the way, he's an ensign in the Marines. Uh, so he's the, the, the lowest rank of, of commissioned officers. And from from Fort de Chart, he is then posted by Boisbriand, uh, the first commandant at Fort de Chart, uh, a French Canadian. He's posted from Fort de Chart 
down here uh, to Kaskaskia. And so this map is based, there are various versions of this map. This happens to be the one from the uh, Cocte Plan at the Bibliothèque Nationale. Uh, there's a different one at the Archive de la Marine out at Vincennes. This is the only colored version uh, of this map. Uh, and it's interesting for a variety of reasons. Uh, it shows uh, French Kaskaskia and, uh, and Indian Kaskaskia. Uh, so it, uh, this map is from the, the time period just after there was that separation of the French village from the Indian village. But, but it also interestingly enough shows the Habitation de, de Malik, uh, who was a lieutenant in the French Marines uh, and was killed by Fox Indians in 1727. It's also interesting because it does show the area around the Salt Springs on the other side of the river, uh, south of what of course is now uh, St. Genevieve. I love the color on this map. Isn't that a nice uh, pastel colors? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, thanks to, uh, to Michael McCafferty, we have a nice translation uh, of if uh, you look at the Indian woman's name down here, you recognize it, Michael? Uh, you're the one who did the, the wonderful translation of this. Michael has rendered this as Dawn's Light Woman. Margahi, I mean, she was baptized. Uh, she's a Christian. And here she is appearing uh, as a godmother uh, in this, uh, I think it's a 1717 document, uh, the baptism performed by uh, Le Boulanger. Huh? As Michael reminds us, this, this, this is not Baker. This is not a Baker. This is a different name. So, right. Okay. So she married a Jacques Bourdin, Bourdon, uh, about 1717. And uh, the seminal issue is his death uh, in some, a seminal issue in many ways for, for Dawn's Light Woman uh, and also for, uh, for Franchon. Uh, who marries this widow. Okay, we have to have a little look at this. Uh, so here we have a Jacques Bourdon, uh, married in the first instance to an Illinois woman, and then he married uh, Dawn's Light Woman uh, after uh, his first Indian wife died. And after his death in 1723, uh, Marguerite marries our guy from Montmayon, uh, Nicolas Pelletier de, de Franchamp. And the issue, of, uh, this is kind of an epilogue. After his death in 1728, killed by Fox Indians, she goes on to marry uh, a third. Well, her, her first husband was a French Canadian, Bourdon. Second husband, uh, Pelletier de Franchon, uh, a Frenchman. And her third husband was also a Frenchman. Uh, okay, so the. This is such an interesting uh, legal complexity uh, because after Bourdon's death, there's the question about his estate, which is very, very large. And there became a huge legal argument uh, between uh, Pierre up here, uh, uh, whose mother was, uh, was Jacques Bourdon's first wife. A legal argument between Pierre and Nicolas Pelletier de Franchum, who married Dawn's Light Woman and went to her defense for the estate of her husband Jacques Bourdon. Is this any any of this making sense? It becomes a, it becomes an extraordinarily heated legal argument during the late summer and early fall of 1723, uh, and Pierre makes the argument that Bourdon's money really came from his mother, uh, who seemed to have been a really extraordinary uh, person. Uh, and and Franchon uh, argues that, uh, interestingly enough for a young man, uh, he argues that we have to adhere to the customary law of Paris, which was kind of only vaguely known in the Illinois country. This is a hugely important issue. The introduction seriously of the customary law of Paris to inheritance practices uh, in the Illinois country. And it's this particular case 
the debate between Pierre and uh, Pelletier de Franchum that finally clarifies the important role of the customary law of Paris. And so here is Franchum, uh, uh, beautiful handwriting. You know, the guy was guy was an amazingly talented guy. Uh, here is is his signature uh, uh, at the bottom. And this is one of the uh, a, a document written by Pelletier himself, uh, which is part of the legal case that he is making on behalf of his wife. So not very long after Bourdon died, Marguerite, Dawn's light woman, uh, uh, marries Pelletier de Franchon. And so Franchon has uh, an integral interest uh, in defending his new wife's interest in the estate argument of Jacques Bourdon as it says here, of the late Sieur Bourdon, who was, you know, who was a hugely important guy. Almost everybody knows about him. He was captain of the militia and uh, an interesting character, had a small library, very interesting guy, important guy. So when he dies, his young wife, Marguerite, Dawn's light woman, marries this dashing French ensign, Pelletier de Franchon. Should we stop here, Will? Do, do people have questions? I, I want to make sure that what I'm saying so far is relatively clear, because in the documents, it's really muddy. But the document- I'll keep going, and uh, uh, people can put questions in the chat. So you're- let me, say, let me say this. This is a muddy case, but it's extraordinary that virtually all of the legal documents have survived. Uh, some are in, uh, in the courthouse in Chester, and some are in, uh, in New Orleans. Okay, and so uh, this case uh, goes to the Provincial Council uh, led by Boisbriand, uh, a three-member council. Uh, 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 Boisbriand and his uh, colleagues had arrived in the Illinois country in 1719. Uh, they had built the first Fort de Chart. And so this case uh, in the summer and early autumn 1723 is referred to them. Uh, and there are many, many, many questions. There's the question about whether uh, Jacques Bourdon's will was legal. Uh, uh, there is the question about whether Pierre, uh, uh, Pierre's claim against the, the Bourdon estate is legal. And so these three counselors led by Boisbriand uh, agonize over this uh, uh, mostly in September and October uh, 1723. And, when, and once again, Franchum is, is leading the defense on behalf of his wife. Here's a, here's a very young guy from Northern France, and uh, he somehow has a copy uh, of this text that you're looking at on the screen. Uh, the text seems to have been brought for the first time to the Illinois country by Boisbriand, and Franchon must have been traveling from Kaskaskia up to Fort de Chart uh, to examine this text. And, and by God, by the time this case was done, Franchon knew the customary law of Paris like any, uh, uh, like any jurist in France. Uh, and he prevails, he prevails. Uh, and the counselors decide, here it says, that they're going to do this, this is, this is the really important part, you see, by the Coutume de Paris. Can everyone see that? Uh, this may be the first instance in any Illinois country document in which this set of customary laws is adduced by name. Okay, so they didn't cut Pierre out, you see Pierre there. Pierre gets one fourth. Uh, a dawn's light woman, a woman uh, according to the Coutume de Paris, gets one half, and one fourth goes to Bourdon's uh, living relatives. In fact, his mother and father were still alive uh, uh, back uh, in Canada. So this is this is a hugely important decision by Boisbriand and his other two counselors in establishing the Coutume de Paris as the governing law code for domestic affairs in the Illinois country. It starts right here. 
And of course, it goes on, actually, it goes on in, into the 19th century uh, uh, because estates done under the Coutume de Paris in the 18th century were still being litigated on, for example, in Missouri, uh, on into the 19th century. Hugely important. Okay, now we're switching subjects, uh, of, as the title of my little presentation suggests, uh, to talk about to talk about the foxes. Uh, and so here we have a Delisle map uh, showing the fox country up there to the west of Green Bay, uh, and we have Kaskaskia down there uh, in the bottom. And you know, the uh, Sharon and I have have uh, discuss this a lot, and it's, it's hard to come to a conclusion. Uh, here is the standard book on the Fox Wars by uh, David Edmonds and, uh, and Pizer. It's, I mean, it's a really, really good book. Many of you may know this book, uh, but this book is almost exclusively from the Canadian point of view, uh, and they don't deal with how the, the Fox Wars uh, intersected with the history of Kaskaskia. In any case, the the, the, the kind of curious thing, which, which is kind of hard to get a grip on, is why when Fox country was up here, obviously kind of important to the Canadians, why the foxes were coming all the way down to Kaskaskia to actually threaten Kaskaskia. I don't know, maybe someone has an answer to that. But, it, you know, it, it seems kind of gratuitous. I mean, I mean, these these habitants in Kaskaskia were hardly a threat to the foxes uh, in their usual uh, stamping ground up here. So, so we never came to an answer about this, about, you know, what, what were they doing down there threatening Kaskaskia? Okay, so this is an issue that Edmonds and Pizer don't deal with because they essentially don't deal with Kaskaskia. They're interested more in the, uh, the Pays d'Anon. So, but there are, you know, there are revealing things in the Kaskaskia records. Uh, here is a, a burial record from 1724, uh, where at the break of day, uh, four men from Kaskaskia are, appeal, are, are killed by foxes. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, they were killed by, here it says the Hanar. Uh, so they were, you know, they were they were on the doorstep of the village of Kaskaskia, and then here's another one: the uh, the chief uh, uh, church warden, the chief Marier, uh, uh Joseph Lamy, uh, was killed at at two steps from the village, and he was brought back in, and he was buried under his because he's the chief Marier, he was uh, buried under his. Uh, Sous son banc under his under his pew in the Kaskaskia Paris Church. You can see the the Boulanger signature there of the priest. And so the, the question is out there: What are these foxes doing down messing with Kaskaskia when their usual area of range is is hundreds of miles north? Uh, Sharon and I have never never come to uh, any kind of a satisfactory answer on that one. Uh, this, these are, this is from a, a record from New Orleans, but the record, they're recording what's going on uh, in, the, uh, in the Illinois country. You see it says, les renards, nos ennemis, sans sujet. That's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting expression in French, sans sujet. Uh, I would translate that as without any reasonable explanation. Well, you can, you might have a different, a different uh, uh, rendering of that. Les uh, nos enemies sans sujet, like, like what the hell, you know? Uh, why are they doing this? Uh, so they, uh, they talk down here further about our enemies, that is to say the foxes, have taken the scalps of two of our Indians, uh, two of our Illinois Indians. Uh, and then this is, really interesting at the bottom that uh, a, a one of the foxes has been taken and burned uh, in the village of Kaskaskia. So uh, the, the way they were treating the foxes wasn't real pleasant either. Uh, uh, but one does wonder, and someone might have an opinion on that because I, I really don't, 
was this Fox Indian burned in the Indian, in the Illinois, the Kaskaskia village, or was he burned in the, the French village? And who would have been, you know, for example, did Marguerite and her husband, Nicolas, uh, did, they, did they witness this burning? Was this a festive occasion in Kaskaskia? We would love to know those things, I think, wouldn't we? Uh, okay, so let's see here. The another, this is 17. Oh, the, the importance here is this is July 1728. And uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, let's see. Uh, the, 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 well, this is nice because they killed, they, uh, they, they killed five Frenchmen. I think one of these five was Franchon in July 1728. Uh, and the other, they cut off his cut off his fists, uh, uh, saying, "This is the way uh, uh, we we deal with them. Uh, this is the way we deal with them." So this was, you know, none of these frontier wars were very pleasant, but this was a really unpleasant thing. But I think that one of the five Frenchmen killed on this occasion was, in fact, Franchon. Uh, he had a premonition that he was going to be killed. And before he went off uh, as an ensign, uh, he uh, drafted an extraordinarily interesting last will and testament uh, in his own hand. Uh, uh, a couple of interesting things. He had a small library uh, that he, uh, uh, he didn't enumerate them or, or give the titles. Uh, but I think maybe one, maybe one volume was the Coutume de Paris. Uh, he conveyed his uh, library to Monsieur de Vincennes, uh, who eventually came, became commandant at Vincennes on the, the Wabash River. Uh, uh, he acknowledges in this will that insofar as he has any finances, they, they have come from uh, his wife, uh, Marguerite, a uh, God's like woman. Uh, he also, and this is to me really interesting, extraordinary, uh, in this will, he admonishes, here's a French guy admonishing his Indian woman to take it easy on their slaves. Uh, it's suggesting that Marguerite was, was a little rough on their slaves and they owned uh, a couple of, of Indian slaves and a couple of black slaves. So I find it fascinating that here's a white guy telling his Indian woman, take it easy on your Indian slaves, which opens all, all kinds of perspectives on, on, on race and slavery, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, he, he drafted this, well, you know, this is in, the original is in the courthouse in, in Chester. Uh, I mean, one of the fabulous documents in the courthouse in Chester, if I may say so. Okay, uh, so here is a document from New Orleans uh, talking about the news, the news that we have received of the death of Franchon. So the news gets down eventually to New Orleans and, and, and sent back uh, to Paris. Uh, he had, in addition to his estate in Kaskaskia, he had apparently in the barracks, maybe at Fort de Chart, a few, a few things and they were auctioned off on August 6th, 1728. So remember that document about the, the five French guys who were killed in July? And so here are his things being auctioned off in August, which makes me think that of those five French guys, uh, probably Franchomme was one of them. This is an interesting document, you know. There's a, uh, one of the things that struck me is that there is a, uh, a, a gunpowder pouch. That is to say, they, they don't seem uh, they don't seem to have been using powder horns. They had a pouch for their powder, and they had a pouch for their for their lead shot. Uh, yeah, well, let's see. One of them is made out of uh, out of uh, a shot pouch made out of uh, made out of a black shot pouch. No, that's a black feather. Oh, that's that's right. Okay. Here, the most the the most expensive item was a black was a black feather. Uh, 
a black feather and a, and a, and a powder pouch, a, 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 a plume noir avec un sac de poudre for, for 21 livres. Huh? And then he had a, <laughs> right, these are interesting items. He didn't have very many things outside of his, his family, uh, outside of his household with Marguerite uh, in, uh, in Kaskaskia. Yeah, it's interesting. Oh, he also, let's see, he has a, he has a, 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 a shot pouch made out of black deer skin uh, decorated with porcupine quills. That wasn't worth all that much. You'd think that'd be worth more than a black feather, wouldn't you? Uh, the signatures are also interesting. Uh, Therese de Ternau, interesting guy. Uh, and here's one of the Saint Ange uh, family members down here, the uh, Saint Ange fils. That would have been uh, Louis's uh, older brother Pierre uh, before he got killed by, by Chickasaws. Okay, uh, okay, this is the epilogue now. Uh, uh, this is uh, Marguerite's third marriage. Curiously enough, she had no children by any one of uh, her French, French Canadian uh, husbands. Uh, uh, it's also interesting. Uh, uh, this, uh, this parish priest, the Jesuit Tacharin, extremely interesting guy, uh, who did this marriage record. And in this case, sometimes he used her Indian name, but in this case, he simply identifies her as, 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 oh, 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 it's up here. Marguerite, a widow of Franchon. And once again, here is her mark, uh, the widow, uh, the widow of Franchon, right. Instead of using her Indian name, but sometimes he does use her Indian name. So why in this particular instance, he didn't. Uh, by the way, some of you probably already know that Tatrin was, has become relatively well known as being one of the Jesuits uh, who was uh, very much in favor of, of Indian uh, French marriages. So this is their third marriage, 1720. Uh, here is uh, that family uh, on the 1732 census. You see uh, Pierre Blow. By the way, he was from, he was from far southwestern France on the Ile Oléron, which is maybe has the best oysters in the world. You know, it's a, I've been there. It's a terrific place, huh? Way down uh, south of La Rochelle. Okay, so here, here is Pierre Blow and his wife, who is Marguerite, uh, Dawn's Light woman. Uh, and they have six slaves. They have. They have three blacks and they have three Indians. So for her entire, so she's an Illinois Indian woman uh, who seems to have been born. We don't know who her parents were. She seems to have been born about the time uh, that, that everyone moved to the Kaskaskia River in 1703. Uh, she married young uh, uh, to Jacques Bourdon, uh, who had a fortune be from his first Indian wife. Uh, the, the Bourdon fortune, which she eventually inherits, actually begins not with Bourdon, but with his first Indian wife. I mean, her son Pierre uh, uh, makes that case, and nobody disputes that. The, all the money, including these slaves, originates with Bourdon's first Illinois Indian wife. Uh, after, and after her death, he marries Marguerite. In any case, the, the wealth of these slaves comes down from the uh, Bourdon's uh, original Illinois uh, Indian wife. Huh? And uh, there, are, there are not burial records for either, either Pierre or Marguerite, uh, but they were still alive in 1740. And as of the 1732 census, uh, they are uh, some of the more prosperous uh, people in the in Kaskaskia. Uh, okay, so we're winding up here. Uh, Sharon Person and I are doing a book on this subject. Uh, and it's, what's it called? It's called, <laughs> what the hell is it called, Sharon? <laughs> no, it's called, it's called Dawn's Light Woman and Nicolas Franchon. 
marriage law in the Illinois country. Uh, <laughs> we've been working on this so long, I've forgotten the title of the book. Uh, in any case, it's going to happen. It's in press. I wanted. I want to conclude by telling you a little story about this uh, chalk, uh, a sketch down in the bottom. Uh, it was done about 1713 by Antoine Watteau. Some of you may know his famous paintings, uh, but he does fabulous. He, he did a series of fabulous uh, chalk sketches. This is the same soldier. Uh, it's it's not three different soldiers. It's it's one shoulder. I call a soldier. I call it the the Rococo Ballet. Uh, have you ever seen a, 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 a anything that elegant for for a military guy? Okay, so I tracked down the original, which is in the most aristocratic institution in Paris, the Fondation Custodia in the seventh arrondissement. And I thought, you know, I'd love to use this on the book. So I thought, well, what the hell, I'll give it a shot. So I emailed them. I said, well, I want to use this on this, this book cover. And, you know, they were amazing. They were amazingly helpful and immediately emailed and said, you know, by all means, uh, use this. Uh, but uh, we do want to copy your book when it comes out. Uh, God willing, I will, I will hand carry a copy. Maybe Sharon will come with me, and we'll we'll carry a copy of a copy of our book to the seventh arrondissement in Paris and convey it to the Fondation Custodia. Thanks a lot for listening to this stuff, Carl. Thanks so much, and and uh, you say the book is impressed with, uh, and where is it impressed? Uh, Southern Illinois University Press. Great, thanks. We look forward to that. Um, one, a uh, couple of comments and uh, in the chat, and uh, if you are uh, with us and have a question, feel free to add it. Um, uh, one thing that you mentioned, going back to uh, the uh, where that. Uh, Fox Indian was uh, burned. Uh, I think probably since it said the village de Cascascia, that would seem to imply, which Michael McCafferty wrote in the chat, that it was the Indian village. Uh, uh, I, uh, it, because it's, I'd have to go back. I have uh, something I've never looked at is uh, how they distinguished between Cascascia, meaning the first right, settlement, right. and the village. Right of the Kaskaskia right, right, right. nearby, right. but probably right. since that, in that document, it was the village de Kaskaskia, I would think it was, it, it must be the Indian, uh, Indian village. Um, maybe, maybe Marguerite and Nicolas opened a bottle of wine and went up there for the celebration. <laughs> Um, and then uh, Emily posted in the chat, uh, going back to your photos from Truncheon's uh, origins, that the baptismal font is almost identical to the one that they have at the church in Kaskaskia. <laughs> right. I, I actually, when I was in Montmayon, I did pin that down, uh, and uh, and the family told me that that was a 16th century baptismal font. Uh, so, you know, it was the real deal. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on the style of baptismal fonts, but it could be, could well be. It must have been a kind of a standard uh, rural uh, baptismal font. And I was uh, interested to see the map because uh, on that same map, you could, uh, where you showed Charleville and that general area, uh, not far from there is Maubeuge, which is where uh, Philippe Renault came from. Oh, really? You're right. Yeah, okay. just uh, not no, about the same period, because uh, he came in at about 1720. I mean, Charleville is where they were making a lot of the muskets, the, the famous Charleville uh, French uh, musket, right? Uh, well, if we do not have uh, any more questions? Uh, and I don't believe we do. I guess I will thank Carl for a wonderful presentation. Always a pleasure 
to hear him speak about uh, any aspect of the history of the Illinois country. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, attending our sessions uh, this week. Uh, we hope in the future, uh, of course, by next year that we'll be able to have a, a conference in person, but I think we also are looking forward to maybe doing more uh, presentations from time to time uh, on Zoom. Uh, it's a great format and, and is pretty easy to set up and uh, keeps us engaged with, uh, uh, with this fascinating subject matter. So thank you very much to everyone for attending. And uh, we certainly welcome any comments you have about the conference. You can send them to our uh, email. And uh, uh, again, thanks to all of our presenters. And I wish you a very uh, good rest of the weekend. And Will, can I jump in for just a second? Oh, yeah, Mark, please. Yes. Please. Well, we've, we, we, we can't end this without thanking you for putting together um, conference. We've had five great speakers, and uh, this is the first time we've done a, an online conference for un unpleasant reasons, but um, it turned out really well. And so, thank you very much for all the time and effort. These, you know, uh, a lot of it, it's it's uh, it's just been wonderful, and and um, I think you set a standard for the for the future here. So, thanks very much. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Well, I will conclude the session here and uh, goodbye, everybody, and hope to see you in person soon. Great.